So, hello everyone. It's great to be here. My name is Marius, and today I will speak a bit about web applications. And here we can see one, actually the mockup. This is how web application may look like, but just when we have an internet connection and we have a connection to application server, and in case we don't have, application looks like that. And this view can be really depressing because uh, we don't want to lose our internet connection. We don't want to see this such a page. And because of that, today, I will speak about offline first. So such application that, uh, in particular cases, can operate without access to remote application server. So there are a few features that can describe such applications. And first of all, those applications need to load all application resources that we need from application server and then store them into, uh, in local uh, browser cache. Then we need to do the same with the data. And then we need to update those data and resources as often as we can, of course, when we have access to our application server to be sure that our application that is actually using those local data have access to the latest version. And someone may ask if we really need to have those offline-first applications, because I'm sure that probably everyone in your homes and offices has internet connection, really fast one. So, but there is still many cases, many situations when we don't have access to any network. For example, when we are traveling or even if we have access to any network, it might be overloaded or slow, or maybe we need to pay some additional money for data transfer. So those are the problems that offline first application needs to deal with. And there are also some benefits because there, is, there shouldn't be any data loss for the user. Imagine a situation when you have web application and there is really long form that you need to fill up and you spend a lot of time doing this and just after you hit the submit button, you realize that you don't have internet or server respond with some kind of error and it can be frustrated. And it shouldn't happen if application will be written as offline first because all of the data that application use are stored locally. And the second benefit can be that applications are usable all the time. So it doesn't matter if we have internet or no, or if this internet is fast or slow, or the server is uh, overloaded. Uh, it doesn't matter. Application should work the same way with the same speed. And this is very important also in case of hybrid applications. So web applications that are hosted as native-like, so for example, using Electron, because of course, in case of classic web application that runs in your browser, user knows that without internet, those applications uh, won't work. Yeah? But in case of native application, users actually used to that such application should also work without internet. So offline first approach can help us with that. And the last benefit that um, offline first application may offers are that those applications maybe could be faster than classic ones because they actually accessing local data and in general accessing local data is faster than accessing remote ones. And uh, wait, here we have a simple algorithm that I believe that every offline application should follow. So first of all, application need to know in which state it is. So if we are offline, so application should work as designed and use local storage. And if we are online, 
So we have access to application server. We should check if there are any updates, if there are any changes that need to be synchronized with remote server. And of course, if there are, we need to synchronize them. But till now, it was just a theory. And now we need to think about how we can implement this and which technologies we can use to make it happen. So one of such technologies can be, for example, service workers. And the simple definition is that service worker is a script that your browser runs in, in the background. Uh, so this is just a definition, and I want to show you how it works. Uh, so imagine online scenario. So we have access to application server, and there are several components. So we have web application, we have service worker, and local cache, and all those components actually uh, is inside our browser. And we have remote one, so we have our server, application server. Mm, and imagine that our application wants to get some data from server. So we are sending a request, get request, and it's handled by service worker, which is actually working as a proxy or interceptor, that uh, it gets our message, do something with this message. In that case, it will uh, just uh, just send this message to remote server and then wait for response. And then, of course, send it back to our web application. But in addition, it stores the data that comes with this response in local cache. Of course, uh, with use of proper URL. And just in case when we are in offline scenario, so we don't have access to our application server, and the same application wants to get the same data. Once more, application just uh, send a get request. And this request is being handled by service worker. But now, service worker knows that there is no connection to remote server. So it will look into our local cache and see if under this URL, send it by web application, we have some data. And if we have, we will just uh, get them and send back to our application. This was about getting data. But what about if our application wants to add some data? So once more, application is uh, sending a POST request. It's handled by service worker. And service worker will instead of sending it to server, because we know that we don't have connection, it will store this request inside local cache in a proper queue, because we might probably want to preserve an order of those messages. And of course, we are storing all those requests. And in case we are back to online, service workers should just get those messages and send them to server of course, in a proper order. And each service worker should have a proper life cycle. So first of all, we need to install service worker, so install a proper script. Then it can be activated. And then it's waiting for messages from the domain that service is connected to, because each service worker is connected to a particular domain. And looking deeper, into code, we can see that this one line is responsible for installing service worker. So we are invoking register method, and we need to pass a script name here. So in our case, it's serviceworker.js. And then we might want to have an event listener. Uh, and here we are listening for install event. This, uh, this event is uh, fired when installation process is over. And here we want to add uh, all required files to cache. And we have, of course, mm, we have our cache. Uh, we have cache name defined inside the script. And we open the cache. We invoke add all method and pass 
required files. So this is the list of all HTML, CSS, and JavaScript files that our application needs to run. And then we want to add another listener, which is fetch listener. So this event is fired when, uh, when the domain to which the service worker is connected send a message to remote server. And of course, here we can get this request and do anything with it. So in this method, we want to put all of our logic to uh, receive documents from the cache, to send documents to our queue to, be, to update later. And now I want to show you a little demo of uh, how a simple application may look like using service workers. I have a video record because... So, as you can see, uh, there is... Wait, I will just... So, this is simple to do application. Uh, so you can add a task to user, and on the left you can see application, and on the right you can see service worker that is installed and running. Of course, there are uh, like update cycles. So we have install, then wait status, and now service worker is active. Now we want to add a new task. So we are adding new online task because we are in online mode. The server is running locally, but it's, it's running. So the task was added. Everything goes OK. Of course, we are in online mode. And now we'll try to shut down our server. Now server is down. And we can see I will just uh, open another browser. Uh, which don't have service worker installed. And we will see that we won't be able to reach this page, of course. OK. We can see that this page can be reached. And Switching back to browser that have service worker installed, we can just refresh the page. And we can see that we have our application and we have our newly added task, and all resources were served from service worker, not from server. Also, task list was served from service worker from the local cache. And now we are in offline mode, so we don't have access to application server, and we want to add a new task. So we are adding new offline task. We will just see on the network how it looks like. And yeah, we added new online task, and it's OK. We have status 200, HTTP 200, so OK. And we can see in the logs that we have this request NQ. So a service worker stored this request inside the queue. And we can see also that we have something called heartbeat checking. So our service worker is constantly checking if the server is up and running again. And now we will want to just turn on the server again. And we can see that the last heartbeat request resulted with 200 OK. And automatically, service worker sent an uh, add request to the server to synchronize offline content. And we can see that on the server side, after server was restarted, there was new task that was added. 
And it's all happened automatically because we have a proper logic inside service worker script. And that is how application, a simple application can work with service worker, so in offline mode. And now we may think about pros and cons of that solution using service worker. So the obvious benefit is that we can implement some offline first functionalities without affecting existing applications. So if we have existing one and we want to add some offline features, we don't need to, uh, to refactor our existing code. And what's more, this solution can work with any front-end framework, with any front-end library, it doesn't matter uh, which framework you use to uh, write your application. It will just work with it. And of course, there are some drawbacks because implementation can be really complex because you need to cover a lot of cases, even if the application is fairly small, uh, and you need to do it all on your own, actually. And the problem might be also the browser compatibility because each browser deals a little bit different with service workers, so there might be some different bugs. And because of that, we might look for maybe some other solution. It's always good to have alternatives. And there are, actually, there are many, but I want to focus on that I was working with previously, and that is the couch database family. So we are talking about CouchDB, CouchBase, Cloudant, and PouchDB. And all of those databases share the same very crucial feature for us, which is built in synchronization protocol. And it works like that. We have PouchDB, which is actually no SQL database that can run inside your browser. And in modern browser, there, this database is built on index DB. And this database can synchronize with remote, for example, CouchDB server. Of course, it looks really well, but there are a lot of problems that comes with this synchronization. And for example, uh, we have conflicts. Because imagine that we have remote CouchDB server and some database uh, on it, and we have two users running in parallel to our application inside two browsers. And CouchDB uh, have each document has something called revision ID. This kind of unique number that is assigned to document. And imagine a situation when uh, both of those users lost their internet connection, and both of them want to um, modify the same document in offline state. So the first user has more luck, and his internet connection is restored faster. And he wants to synchronize his local database with remote one. And it's going according to plan. And there is new revision ID being assigned. And now the second user wants to do the same. So he has his internet connection back. And he wants to synchronize his local database with remote one. But unfortunately, revision ID is different because he has the old number. And this is actually when the conflicts occurs. And of course, those updates are sent to CouchDB server. And CouchDB can deal with such conflicts because if we look deeper into the document structure, we can see that we have a main document and we have a set of revision. Actually, uh, revisions are in tree-like structure. But what's important, uh, we can order CouchDB to get some single revision and switch main, main document with this revision. So this is the way that we can handle conflicts, for example. And going into the code, if our front-end application wants to use PouchDB, so of course we need to load the script, and we need to create a PouchDB object and set database name. 
And of course, if this database under this name exists already, it will be returned. And if we don't have such database, it will be created automatically. And we can invoke sync method. So we need to pass a proper remote database URL. And we may want to add some additional properties. Like, for example, set life to true. It means that a synchronization process will uh, be will be going into the background, and it will constantly check for any changes, any changes that can be synchronized. And the setting retry to true, it means that even if the connection to remote database will break, it will still retry and retry to synchronize the local database. And it's all we need, actually, to synchronize our local database, but there is more because probably we want to also know when our local data are updated because we want to update also user interface. So there is changes method that we can subscribe on and we can look for any changes make, make to our local database. And there are also some additional parameters like, for example, setting life to true. It means that in the background, uh, PouchDB will be constantly checking for changes and include docs set to true because by default it's false. And actually, if it's false, you will just, inside this method, you will just get, um, you will just get change type and you will get document ID without any data. So if we will set this to true, we will get also the document data. And what is also really nice that CouchDB offers also built-in module for authentication. So it works like that. CouchDB server has built-in uh, user database. So it contains all the data about users that has access to any database on the server. And it also have authentication API that we can use. And we don't need to write one on our own, of course, if it's enough for us, of course. And something that is connected to authentication is also user management. So uh, actually, in case of offline first applications, it's more difficult to manage users and their data because we have local database, we have remote database, and I want to show you two approaches uh, different. Uh, one is using super login. So super login is actually a JavaScript library that you can use inside your Node.js server application. And it offers two things. First is API for user management. So all the endpoints like login, register, change password, uh, forget password, etc. And the second thing is that it works as manager for um, database connections. So we can configure super login in such way that it can, on, regist on registering you, new user process, it will automatically, for example, create a private dedicated database for that user inside CouchDB server. So, and of course, when this user is login, so, Super login will return proper token and the proper database connection. Uh, so actually, super login offers a quite popular pattern in the world of NoSQL, uh, which is named database per user. So each of our users will get dedicated database. And it has some advantages because, for example, scalability. Uh, it's uh, it's a solution that is quite easy to scale because with growing number of users, we may add some additional instances to our CouchDB cluster. And security, because each user will have the database that is dedicated to him and restricted by his login and password, and he, can, he, he don't have access to any other user databases. And to configure uh, to configure uh, PouchDB, to configure SuperLogin, uh, we need to create a configuration object 
which consist from several sections, like for example, mm, for example, uh, DB server, which has all properties that are needed to connect to remote couch DB server. Mm. Here we have also security section, with, which has properties for security. And uh, most important from our perspective is user DBs, uh, which has uh, like default DB section. And here it is set to private. It means that each user will get his private database just for him. And we have some naming pattern. So to do is the name of our application. And the name of the database will look like this prefix to do, then the dollar sign, and then username. And inside JS script, we need to, of course, load the proper script for super login, create an object, and use something that is called super login router. So this is the first approach using super login. And the next one I wanted to show you is, is actually called Envoy. And Envoy is something more than just library because it's also a service that works like a middleware between our application and CouchDB server. Uh, so what it offers is actually from our web application perspective, it is the same as super login because it just offers us a pattern uh, called database per user. But it's from application perspective. But uh, on CouchDB side, we have just one database, just one big database, and there are data for all of the users. But Envoy is marking each document with a user or user list. Um, and only those users can have access to this document. So Envoy is guaranteed that each document, uh, that user which log in, uh, will see only documents that actually belongs to him. So this, this solution also has some advantages because we are more flexible about our data. So we can, for example, share some data between users. And that was really hard uh, on this previous example. Uh, but of course, we lost some of this scalability because still we have one big database and it's far more difficult to scale. And I consider it maybe, some, maybe less secure than the first approach because we have additional layer with all those privileges and it can be complicated. So we might have some security issues here. And if we are talking about security, there is one more problem that for example, classic application on front-end side doesn't have, but this offline-first approach brings new problems like client-side security. Because normally, when we have a classic front-end application and we have request response, so most of the security is actually on the back-end. Because there we have privileges, roles, we restrict access to data, we restrict access to servers, we use uh, secure protocols, but in offline first application, we have a copy of database stored locally on client's computer, and probably many users can actually access this computer. And we might restrict situation when some user can see other users' data. Of course, it probably not happen in our application, but as I've said before, PouchDB is built on IndexedDB, so user can go to browser, can go to developer tools, and can see what, what is uh, inside IndexedDB. And of course, by default, all documents are in plain, plain text. Uh, but we have some libraries that can offer additional features to PouchDB. So for example, encryption. And one of those solutions is crypto pouch. And uh, here we have a, a, a code to set crypto pouch. But what crypto pouch do actually is on the fly, transparently, encrypting and decrypting data for us. So 
it will encrypt data just before those data go to PouchDB. So if we look inside IndexedDB, we'll see that data are encrypted. But if we want in our application, of course, if we, um, if we properly use crypto pouch and set a proper password, we can decrypt those data just before there are, we, we, we want to get them. Uh, so we want to get data and and crypto pouch will on the fly decrypt them. Also, in case of synchronization, so when the data are being synchronized, uh, crypto pouch will decrypt them and then send to the remote database. And now I want to show you demo of the same application that will use PouchDB. Okay, so now we can see the same application, but it's a little bit different because we have a login form and all of the users are stored inside CouchDB server. So here we have a server and we can see that we have one database for user named test. And we can see that this database contains two documents, actually task one and task two. And we want to log in as this user, some test and some password, and we have this list, task one and task two, as you saw, but it, those data, do, it's not uh, served from CouchDB, but from, index, from, from PouchDB, so we can see that under IndexDB, we have a proper database for test user, and here we have two tasks, task one and task two. And now we want to create a new user. So we will put here some new login. Application, we will know that this user uh, not exists and it will create one and register automatically. And then there should be super login will create a new database for him. So we can see that new database was created for this user automatically. And of course, it's empty, so we want to add some new items. We will add new online item because we are in online mode. So server is running. And we can see that this task was added and synchronized with remote server already. And now I want to show you how this synchronization works in practice. So we will have two browsers, so Chrome on the left and Edge on the right, and we will login as the user that we created before. And now we can see the same view on both browsers. And we want to add a new task. So new task from Chrome. Yeah, clicking add and it's added to local PouchDB, but already synchronized with remote one, and on Edge, it's already synchronized also. And the same from Edge to Chrome. So those local database now are in sync with remote database. But now we will just turn off container, Docker container that runs our CouchDB server. And we can see that we can't reach this server anymore. Yeah, so it's down. And going back to our application. Now we will add new offline task in the Chrome browser. So new offline task from Chrome. And we can see that it was added, but it wasn't synchronized on Edge because remote server is down. And new offline task from Edge. And now we want to turn on uh, Docker container again. And we will see how synchronization process goes. So, yeah, Edge was first, and it is already synchronized on Edge, and 
Yeah, and now on Chrome also. So now uh, two local databases are in sync with remote one. And just consider the pros and cons of this solution using PouchDB. So the first one will be that implementation is uh, easier because we have many functions out of the box like uh, handling conflicts, like synchronization mechanism and authentication, and we can use them. But of course, we are attached to one technology. And it can be problematic because there are some restrictions. And of course, if our application, uh, if the offline first functionality is not crucial for our application, if it's just you know, nice to have, uh, this might be a problem that we need to stick with CouchDB and PouchDB. But if our application can take really benefits from offline first approach, we might consider using such technologies. And to summarize this presentation, uh, what I wanted to show you is actually the, just the, the first glance of this approach. But of course, it can be used. Uh, for example, I use it in one of uh, the application that I was created, uh, that I cre I've created, and that was application for, for production, for people working on facilities, and then they don't have internet, actually. So the offline first uh, was really mm, crucial there. And of course, there are application that can utilize this offline first approach, but not always. Like, for, as I, for example, I can't imagine chat application using offline first approach. So uh, it actually depends on the application you are creating. But if you or your application might take ben some benefits from offline first approach, I encourage you to just dig deeper into this subject and uh, so this, this simple project that I showed you is hosted, its source code is hosted on my GitHub and username is Byteparian. So feel free to download it and, and just play a little bit. And that's actually all I have for this presentation. So thank you for your attention and goodbye. <laughs>